911. What's the location of your emergency? Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the emergency is exactly, but I think there's somebody that's been taken without the, uh, they don't want to be where they need to be. And we're in a 95 Green Camaro from Northport somewhere. Okay. How do you know this? I know. Is he going to hurt the girl? I do. Even when Denise herself called, nothing was done. Please, please. Where are you at? Can you tell if you're on I-75? I don't know where your phone is. I'm sorry. We grow up knowing that if something terrible happens to us, we can always call emergency services. They're there to help. Sadly, in Denise Amber Lee's case, 911 did nothing to help even after four calls pointed in her direction. When the police tracked Michael Lee King, it was too late. This is the full story of Denise Amber Lee and her tragic death. Today's story begins with a young family of four. Denise Amber Lee was born on August 6th, 1986 in Inglewood, Florida, the daughter of Sue and Rick, a retired detective. Denise was set on being an independent adult from a very young age, and perhaps that wouldn't have happened if she hadn't met the love of her life so early. Denise and Nate Lee met in high school. Nate was a cool kid hanging out in the back of the school, and Denise was a quiet, dutiful student. But it was Denise who asked Nate out during senior year. One of the main things about Denise was she was, she was pretty quiet. Um, she just wasn't a very outgoing person. She actually talked to me first, and uh, I always thought that was the most ironic thing ever because, you know, as quiet as she was, and people find out that she's the one that approached me. Confusingly enough, Valentine's Day was just three days after their first date. It was kind of awkward because, you know, we had just met and, you know, Valentine's Day was already there and we both didn't know what, you know, you know what we should do. We're falling in love. I ended up getting her just a little, probably $40 uh, ring with a heart on it. Denise never took that ring off again and it would become a huge clue after her tragic fate. A year and a half later, the two got married. It was meant to be for both of them. They were happy together and they were both eager to start a family. Within two years, Denise and Nate had two sons, Noel and Adam. But this brought a certain degree of financial hardship for the couple. Denise was a stay-at-home mom and Nate had three jobs to support the family. We were going through what most people would say some tough times. You know, we had two little kids and we were young. Money wasn't necessarily on our side. It didn't phase us. We were, we knew we were gonna be fine and we knew we were, you know, gonna grow old together. However, it was precisely this financial hardship that pressed the couple to rent a house out in a dangerous area, a bedroom community in Northport, Florida. It was mostly a group of newly constructed but abandoned houses after an economic crisis in the early 2000s. As soon as my, myself and our mother saw it, we go, we're not real happy about this house out here. But the rent was cheap and the house was big and the couple was happy. So Denise's dad, Rick, had to accept the situation. Sadly, this neighborhood would seal Denise's fate in the worst way imaginable. On January 17, 2008, Nate left early in the morning for his first job, and Denise stayed home with her two boys, as usual. Around 11 a.m., they had their last phone conversation. We were just talking about, you know, what we normally talk about. And uh, I remember asking her that morning to make sure you open the windows so we don't, you know, turn the air off, save some money. Okay. And uh, she said she already had. At 3 p.m., Nate left for work and called his wife again. But this time she didn't answer, which was very strange. Denise always picked up. In the 25 minutes Nate took to drive home, he called her eight times to no avail. When he got home, he found six-month-old Adam and two-year-old Noel cuddled together in the crib. This wasn't normal. I, I, I started freaking about then, I, 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 and then I looked at the windows. I noticed it was hot in the house, and I noticed the windows were pushed down, but they weren't shut and latched. Denise's phone and keys were also left lying around, so she'd left in a hurry or without her consent. This was when the first 911 call happened. Northport emergency? Uh, yes, um, I'm at 7912 uh, Latour Avenue. Uh, mm -hmm. I just got home from work and my wife, I can't find her. 
my kids were in the house, and I don't know where she is. I've looked every single place. But it would be a long time until the police would take this call seriously. When spouses go missing, the police sometimes think it's a different scenario, much more benign than a kidnapping. Meanwhile, Nate called Denise's dad, Rick, who had worked 25 years as a detective. Worried sick and knowing how police treat missing spouses' cases, he rushed to the police station and urged them to take the case seriously. So the detectives got to their North Fort home and started digging around. I was by myself the whole time, so like, I kept thinking it could have been me, you know, if people would have stopped here. That's right. Within minutes, Denise's neighbor Jennifer said she saw a white man parked in the green Camaro in Denise's driveway. Jennifer left for a few minutes, and when she looked outside again, he was gone. So she didn't assume the worst. The police issued a BOLO, be on the lookout, for the green Camaro. Rick was also asking for the help of everyone he knew and had worked with. When he called his journalist friend, he was surprised to hear him crying for the first time. He was crying. And that struck me because I, as long as I've known him, I've never, I've never really known him to show emotion, let alone to show emotion of that magnitude. I said, what's going on? He says, my daughter's been kidnapped. But the police were just about to get the worst 911 call of them all. At 6.14 p.m., someone called 911. The call is truly hard to listen to, but Denise was very smart. She was pleading with the kidnapper on the phone, all while inserting details relevant to the 911 dispatcher, her name, her address, and even details about the car and kidnapper. She's making it seem like she's talking to him. You know, she's answering the 911 operator's questions by laying on the phone listening to it. Giving some sort of a description of the guy? Yeah, and her baby's at home alone and her address, but she's given the exact address to the 911 operator, but she's making it sound like she's talking to him. I mean, she was really smart. He never knew it until like seven minutes into the call, then he finally figured his phone wasn't there. And he... Yeah, Denise was talking on the kidnapper's phone that she'd snatched from him while he was driving. But eventually he figured it out, took back his phone, and interrupted the call. Both Nate and Rick were called to the police station to identify Denise's voice in the call and confirm it was her. Imagine hearing your loved one screaming and begging for help and knowing you can't do anything about it. But Nate was sure this is all the police needed to track her down. I was 100% sure that they were gonna get her. You know, cell phone, they can track her, they can figure this out. But the kidnapper had a burner phone. The police couldn't track its GPS. They could see where it pinged. However, they could identify who the burner phone belonged to, Mike Lee King. The police asked Denise's family if they knew this person, but no one had ever heard of him. Why did he target Denise? What were his awful plans? Shortly after Denise's harrowing 911 call, yet another came in. This time it was Mike King's own family calling, his cousin's daughter, Sabrina Muxlow. And the girl came out of the, like, got out of the car, and my, co my dad's cousin went and put her back in the car, and when she got out... Okay, where's your, where's your dad's house? Um, it's in North Florida. King had stopped at his cousin's house with Denise, tied her inside his car. He borrowed a shovel and a gas tank. Sheesh. Less than 10 minutes after this call, 911 received another call from a witness driving past King's car. I'm on 41 going south. And I was at a stoplight, and a man pulled up next to me, and there was a child screaming in the car. Not a happy vehicle at the end. It's a blue Camaro. There were a few problems with the call. It wasn't a child, it was Denise. The Camaro was green, not blue. And the dispatcher was in a different county this time, so they had no idea about Denise's case. And the final problem, the dispatcher was super distracted. Just one second. He's gonna turn left on Toledo Blade. He's turning left right now. Do you want me to turn? Try to follow him or? Okay, does he want her to follow him? 
It was a matter of seconds, but Jane, the witness, lost him. Then at 6.50 p.m., another 911 call came in. 911, what's the location of your emergency? Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the emergency is exactly, but I think there's somebody that's been taken without their, uh, they don't want to be where they need to be. And we're in a 95 green Camaro from Northport somewhere. Okay. How do you know this? I know. Is he going to hurt the girl? I do Four 911 calls were received within an hour. Yet all the helicopters, police cars, and officers looking for Denise failed that night. When the police finally tracked Mike King's home address and went over, they realized they were too late. There was duct tape inside the house, but no people. Meanwhile, the police tracked the last caller. It was Harold Muxlow, Mike King's cousin. So the police paid Harold a visit. The lawnmower broke down and it's stuck in a ditch gas and a shovel. Harold initially thought that it was yet another one of Mike's crazy relationships. Hours later, he had a change of heart and called 911. At 9.16 p.m., an officer pulled over the green Camaro. Mike King was behind the wheel, alone. He was soaking wet, his phone had its battery removed, and in his trunk was a muddy shovel. He was immediately arrested. Inside the interrogation room, the police let Harold visit and recorded Mike's bogus account. He claimed that both he and Denise had been kidnapped and that the kidnapper took Denise somewhere before letting him go. The police knew that this was a big lie, but it took two more days until the police dog sniffed out Denise's body. She'd been violated and shot in the head and then buried in a marshy area. She was just 21. Denise's family was destroyed. It was such a sudden, senseless attack. What had Denise ever done to deserve this? As the police looked at Mike King's past, it revealed that Denise was at the wrong place at the wrong time. King had been a sexual predator for a long time. He was a 36-year-old out-of-work plumber with a dark history of rape, public exposure, and even pedophilia. Sadly, none of these incidents were reported to the police at the time. They just came out when the police started talking to people who knew King. If King hadn't chosen Denise that day, he would have chosen someone else. And this time, he was set on killing. The police were ready to put this tragic case on the solved shelf. But just then, Jane the witness called. So I called them and said, you know, I'm the 911 caller who called in. Do you need any more information from me? And um, they didn't know who I was. Seeing on the news Mike King's arrest, Jane recognized that was the man she'd seen on the road and that what she thought was a child was in fact Denise. But when she spoke to the police, she realized her 911 call was never sent out. Jane was the last person to see Denise alive and she was ready to follow the Camaro. The 911 dispatcher just didn't listen. If someone would have responded to that call, I mean, the outcome could be different. Apparently, the dispatcher just shouted out details about the call to the other dispatchers in the office. She was supposed to write them in the computer database, and the dispatchers were supposed to call the officers in town. No one did their jobs that night. The sheriff of Charlotte County, who intercepted Jane's call, even went public to defend his team. The assumption is that Charlotte County screwed up and could have saved this girl's life. That's what everybody's thinking, and I'm, t and I'm telling you, that until the facts come out here, that's, a, that's the wrong assumption to make. Well, the truth is Denise could have been saved. Five 911 calls were made, one of them belonging to a very frightened Denise. She gave them every detail she had, and so did the witness. Yet somehow Mike King had the time to stop by his cousin, take her home, do the absolute worst, and then drive her body and bury her. The dispatchers received a two-day suspension. Mike King was found guilty and sentenced to death. In a sad final twist, Denise had left her heart-shaped ring in the back seat of King's car. She knew she would die that night, so she left the ring hoping the police would at least catch her killer. Nate started the Denise Amber Lee Foundation in hope of helping 911 centers get better at offering much needed help to callers. Hopefully Denise's horrifying story will prevent other similar stories. Hey, thanks for watching. What do you think about this case? Let me know in the comment section and don't be shy. Like this video and subscribe to my channel for more blood chilling cases. Until next time.